Thankfully, we know someone who is. <laughs> My guy, thanks for coming back in. I think last time we talked was about a year ago, and it was technically before it was like officially a show. Yep. Um, so kind of second episode, kind of first episode, and I think the biggest difference between now and then is that you're now a dad of two. True. So last time it was dad of one, and I was amazed that you could run a business in a studio and be successful as a father and a business owner. <clears throat> and now that challenge just got even bigger, yep. and it's been even more exciting, dude. Yeah, how's that? Studio is busier. Kids are crazier. Dude, <laughs> there's more. <laughs> there's double of them. <laughs> there is, yeah, dude, I can't imagine it. I like. I can barely take care of myself and run my own business, and you're taking care of yourself, running your own business, yeah. and this whole other family unit. And I don't know how you have like enough time in the day. Well, I have a Lisa. Okay. You don't have a Lisa. This is also true. So you have another <laughs> half to help you with some of the duties, but you're still, you're yeah. still doing a lot there helping yeah, Sharon. Yeah, for sure. How does the, how are you running a business and a family? Like how does a day work? What is like a, how does this balance happen? So my, so I've been booked now every day since August. Jesus. Last August. Yeah. So, and it's now January? Yes. Yeah, so six months. Yeah. What are you doing? So, and when I say every day, mind you, I'm talking like full time. So like a normal week for me is like four 10 hour days, like usually Thursday through Sunday, 10 and hour days. What is, what are you doing for 10 hours? I think I kind of know this answer yeah. but for anyone who doesn't know. It, yeah. So in, in those four 10 hour days, I have an artist with me in studio now. I, that, that's another huge difference between last time we got together was a lot of the stuff I was doing post, like during pandemic and mm -hmm. shortly after pandemic was a lot of remote stuff, a lot of writing stuff. Now I'm kind of back to, there's an artist or a band in the studio 40 plus hours a week every week now wow okay. which is way more fun for me <laughs> I bet. Yeah, yeah yeah you get to be with people yeah yeah and you just enjoy that part of the process yep. more yeah i get to hang out with other musicians and and be a part of their creative process and and it it's a lot more hands-on than like hey we're done with this song do your thing or mm -hmm. hey here's an instrumental write us a song and then we'll listen to it like it's yeah. like you know face-to-face -face creating with people, which is a lot more fun for Is me. it often the same person for four days, or is it often four different people, or is it kind of some mix of the a two? A little of both, yeah. So some of the bands that I'm working on, like, full-length albums with, will do, like, you know, two four days, um, two two four days um, in a row, and then we'll just stay over and we'll bang it out. And mm -hmm. sometimes in those cases, we actually end up building in, like, 15-hour days. So... Well, I can't do four of those in a row. I've uh, I've tried. I've done it with one band, and it's just kind of miserable. I bet, yeah. But um, yeah. In those cases, we'll do like nine a.m. to midnight, or ten a.m. to one the next morning, and then wake up and and start again at ten. But um, but yeah, it's it's cool. I like having people there a lot more. And then I still do have like a day, maybe two days, um, that I'll, I'll bang out Monday through Wednesday, where I'll do just a bunch of mastering catch up on my own editing and stuff that from the last four days mm -hmm. um do that like the the little bit of remote work that's still trickling in um i have a couple engineers now that use me strictly for mastering um one of them that i get a lot of stuff from is this guy brandon in miami and he'll basically work with an artist like f for five four or five days straight in miami and then at the end of the week send me all the songs that they finished and i'll just master those on monday wow. so every week i'm getting a ton of stuff from him and that's yeah. crazy yeah that's uh, such an opposite output on so many i think the the first opposite big difference there is i'm so used to working with people like one day a week and then i am working by myself the rest of the time and i really enjoy that yeah and the other thing is like you're cranking out uh, how many songs a week 10 20 songs a week sometimes maybe sometimes um, yeah it, it really depends because some of the artists that I'm working with are like solo artists, singers that either we've created beats together and now we're like doing vocals or they're coming in with beats from an array of producers. Like one of the guys that I'm doing an album with right now gets a bunch of his beats from Jelly Rolls DJ, the Cliffy, Cliffy, I believe okay. is his name, DJ Cliffy something. Sure. Um, so like what, he can come in and do like five songs a day because we'll we'll spend 10 12 hours and the beats are already done and i'm kind of just tracking vocals mm -hmm. other bands like i'm still working with justice michael a ton he'll come in with a loose idea or just some lyrics or something and we'll spend a whole 10 hour session at least like writing the instrumental finalizing the lyrics getting the vocal melodies finalized like taking a song from zero to 
almost ready to be mastered all in one day. So kind of depends on the workflow. That's a, another weird one to me because, yeah, I'm putting out I, – I was joking recently that I, like, I don't have that many good ideas. Like, there's only so many good <laughs> ideas that I can produce, and I think we all have some limit of that. Yeah. And in the context of a music video, like, it takes so long to execute an idea, and the ideas have to be so thorough and well thought out and well coordinated that it's like, yeah, I, I don't have three of those ideas a day or ten of those a week. Like, I have For one sure. of them a month, maybe two a month if I'm really like on it yeah. as far as like how much I think is – feasible to get done and maybe I should ask for help to get more done but that's a, a weird thing to be putting out that many ideas a day and to have and I know sometimes the artist is coming in with some ideas and sometimes sure. they're saying Sean what do we what do we write in today yeah and I yeah I think it's incredible to be able to put out that many things and be proud of all of them and I assume they're all like a diverse array of things too it's that not makes just, it easier I think too okay. is like I'll go from one day doing like southern rock country stuff to the next day doing like a 1975 pop thing to the next day like chain twist is in doing like new metal so it's like the the things that people are bringing me are sparking a lot different ideas from me gotcha. i'm not like a kind of repeat process like this is how we do it like this is how i'm going to do this whatever this is how i'm going to come up with ideas it's kind of like my job's super reactive so even if if somebody comes in i'm reacting to their idea like all right how can i take your idea and get it up to par with what i think a finished song sounds like and you're going to be happy and, and think that i met your idea or like what are the files you've sent me and how can i make them translate and sound like i think a finished song sounds like so 90 percent of the time i'm reacting there's that 10 percent of the time where people are like what should we do? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, two things. One, I shot my first country video recently, so I'm very happy you said that. Nice. It's coming out in the next couple of days, and I think it's announced, and if it's not, then I'll cut this, and I'm looking at a timestamp to remind myself. Um, but it's for a band called John Cott Band. They're from Louisiana, cool. and it was so fun. It was just like you said, where it's a, yeah, it was like a breath of fresh air to work on a different genre and do something fun, and I think... Yeah, when I I think when I first started shooting, it would have been like, no, it's so hard to do that. And now it's like, no, I feel like I've got the the skill set in one area and it's really fun to be able to go apply that to a different genre and figure out yeah. how country videos are shot and yeah how it works differently um so it's fun that there's a parallel there and that kind of refreshing nature of working on different kinds of audio yeah um there was a part two to that statement that i'm totally blanking on uh you said it was reactive um i I've also felt the same way that oftentimes I'm not coming up with an idea. Oftentimes it is an artist coming to me saying, hey, we want a, a dark video. We want a breakup story. We want a bright video, colorful, uh, whatever, a hundred sure. different things you could want. And I tell myself I'm reactive in that. And I don't think that's totally genuine. I think I tell myself that because it helps me not feel like it is my thing. And it's like I, I do have to take a lot of control over it and help shape that idea. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's easier to pretend that I am doing it for someone instead of taking the lead on this thing is there a similar do you think there's any truth in that for you as well where you're like you say it's reactive but you are in the driver's seat more than maybe you're giving yourself credit for yeah and yeah definitely and there's times where I'll come up with a reactive idea and the artist is like oh maybe not and like in a a lot of times in those situations it whether it's me coming up with the idea or them coming up with the idea if either one of us is like on the fence about it, mm -hmm. I like to just see it through. Mm -hmm. I like to say like, I'll throw the kitchen sink at every song that I make mm -hmm. and then we'll pull it back. We'll yep. take out the stuff that sucks. But if there's any ideas that go unturned, me or them is going to be like, eh, I don't know about this song. Mm -hmm. What if we did that thing? You know? So it's best to just kind of do it and, and yeah. then reevaluate. I love that. I, but I, love I feel this like sentiment. Yeah. in your case, a lot of people probably come to you. At least I don't. When we work with you, our expectation is like we have this song. Maybe we, maybe I have a vision of like a story in my head when I write it, or maybe we kind of have a visual idea of like we want it to be dark or light or mm -hmm. big or small or tight or whatever. Sure. But when we bring those ideas to you, we're like fully expecting you to just be like that's not going to look good <laughs> on camera. Here's how we should do that. Yeah. Like yeah. So it's. It's kind of a, you know, similar, it's similar I, uh, On my end, it's interesting because they're, like, that works with you guys better than it would with other people. It's just because I know you so well that I'm both comfortable saying no, and I'm also comfortable that if I say, but how about this, that I am acting in your best interest, and that when we get there, you're going to be happier with Absolutely, this. Absolutely, yeah. Um, 
I assume it's a similar thing in audio, like you were saying, of, yeah, you kind of have to see the idea through. And for me in video, I always start with uh, the conversation for planning. always starts with, you know, if this was a Hollywood movie and budget didn't exist, what is the video we would make? And then, yeah. of course, yeah, budget has to come into play and we scale that back. Yeah. But it sounds like a similar thing of like, no, let's throw the kitchen sink at this song and see everything through. Uh, Unfortunately, in video, you can't shoot six videos and pick the best one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get 12 treatments written up and then pick the one you like yeah. the best. Well, I, ideally you do, though. I mean, ideally uh, I have things demoed out, and I think when I'm writing a treatment, and I'm, uh, I think what you guys get is often a, a, a small fraction of the prep I do, and it's a summary of it that is relevant to you. Yeah. But I think I've found that the best video comes when I've arrived at set, and in some capacity I have mentally filmed this video. I have mentally wandered around this place and I've uh at some point during the pandemic I got into working in like 3D animation stuff. Yeah. And in that you can build a room and you can make any camera you want, any zoom, any focal length for our camera people or any zoom kind of fisheye or super zoom length. And you can explore the room and it's a great exercise of how to explore a room and how to yeah, just see all the options in the room and see what all the different things were. That's cool. And it was really interesting like So not, how you did the dumb lovers video? Um Yes, that's a bedroom one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that was a uh, uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, it's Dumb Lovers by Half Hearted. It's a lyric video. Yep. Uh, and it's a, a house that was photo scanned online. So I don't know whose house it was, but someone took a lot of pictures of their house. Cool. <laughs> and scans that into a 3D model, and then yeah, I animate the camera to go through the house and added the words in later. Yeah. Um, but it was a really interesting experiment. On like you said, I can't film six videos, but there are other ways that I can get that same. Uh, same idea and at the highest level I've heard Taylor Swift films videos um, and I don't know if this is true for her at all I've probably heard this on the internet somewhere and maybe it's true for someone else of her caliber but they film a full video with a Taylor Swift stand-in a full production whole whole thing they send it to Taylor and go yes or no, no and then way. apparently she's very hands-on at adjusting it and I probably got this from a Twitter yeah. somewhere. Like, who knows? Um, it doesn't sound uh, I can't imagine. possibility, yeah. Yeah, it seems plausible. Um, but it is interesting. Like, yeah, you can't shoot the video. You can't shoot six videos, but you can do this thing and kind of tweak it so that by the time we are on set, I have figured out why purple is going to work good or why yellow is going to work good or whatever. The yeah, that's true. I've good. never really seen the, the pre-production side of video because you show up and you're like, stand here. This is what the shot's going to look like mm -hmm. once you're in it. You know, it's, it's, I, I'm sure there's a lot that you do that goes into it that I don't even realize. <laughs> I'm sure it's the same with audio, though, where it's the, the idea of if I do my job well, all you have to do is show up. And I've, yeah. I use the plumber analogy often of, like, if I'm, if I'm a plumber and I show up at your house, like, my job is to fix the sink. I'm not asking someone to hold the hammer. I'm not asking someone to, like, hold this light for me. Like, yeah. my job is to show up with the stuff and get the job done do and it, leave. Yeah. And I think in audio, I assume it's a similar thing of like, yeah, if, an, if you and an artist are in perfect synergy, no one is working. They are showing up and they're showing up with ideas and you're showing up saying, awesome, let's direct it this way yeah. and make it happen. Um, I got a little sidetrack there. I want to come back to this whole idea of a day and how you manage to have all these things happening. So yeah, that is what is going on from 4 to 10 p.m. a couple days a week, or sorry, 10 hour day, 4 10 hour days. Yep, yeah. I got my numbers confused there. Normal days um, I do 10 to 8. 10 to 8. Yeah. Damn. That's not what I do normally. Sleep so. in a little bit. Mm -hmm. I feel like when I'm done by 8, it's, you know, not too late. And yeah. It's a good day. And that's a... Uh, and you're eight, I think you're, having a studio at home is also a good asset there to be able to yeah. make that happen. Yeah. Um, the studio... Yeah, it's nice how it's set up because from, like, the artist's perspective, they never actually have to go into my, like, living space or my house when they're there. Like, but if I'm, like... I want to run upstairs real quick. No big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know you're getting even more DIY with that and working to add in a, a bathroom yep. <laughs> to yeah. the studio. That's the next step. Um, yeah. I bring it up because I love that owning this business for me has like, I've had to learn how to be an electrician. I feel like I've had to learn how many volts a house can take, or I'm still learning the term. So some electrician out yep. there is calling me an idiot, <laughs> but uh, yeah, trying to figure out how to not blow up a house when I'm plugging in lights and how many lights I can plug in uh, and yeah, you started a business as an audio producer, and now you're building a bathroom to support yep. your business. And I love how all-encompassing it is. Uh, I know you also worked on getting the space treated. Like, what is, yeah, what's your experience been in all the different things you've had to learn to make this happen? Yeah, so when I moved in, when I bought the house, basically where the studio is is just 
the open foundation of the house. Mm-hmm. It was a completely untreated basement with just nothing. It was just concrete walls and that was it. And that's kind of what I was looking for, just a big open square that I could kind of mold into anything I needed. Mm-hmm. So I, I started by um, putting up a wall like straight down the center of it with a booth um, coming off the back of the wall, like a seven by seven ISO booth with a window in towards the mixing room. Um, so yeah, I, luckily I have family that helped, had a lot of tools and had some sort of direction for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was my grandfather and he's, you know, still helping me lift drywall and stuff. Like, yeah, he's awesome. Um, so I had a lot of help in that aspect, but yeah, I did learn a lot. And, um, by the end of the project, I was like comfortable, like doing full days, like by myself of like Mm -hmm. putting up walls and stuff. and, And it was really cool. Um, and then kind of the next step there was on the other side, I did that drum area where we shoot Parker's covers and, and track drums. That was much easier because that's all isolated by moving blankets. So it's an unfinished ceiling um, and then inside, hung like a couple feet inside the concrete walls is just all moving blankets and then like sheets to kind of cover the moving blankets. So that was much, much easier. The bathroom is probably going to be pretty tough. Um, as far as the treatment goes, that was a lot to wrap my head around at first. Absolutely. Um, I got a bunch of help from my friend, Brandon, uh, Brandon all's house, I believe is how you say his last name. Um, he's a mastering engineer. Um, and he is just super good at what he does. Very knowledgeable, like has really awesome monitors and a really nice treated space. And, let me pick his brain a ton during that process. So that was very helpful. And then I also worked with another company called GIK Acoustics. Um, I think they're in Atlanta. And they have a service where you can get a, like a measurement mic that'll measure. It's so cool. Yeah. yeah please, it'll, please. It'll, once I had the room set up um, with the walls and the ceiling and I figured out the like sweet spot in the room for my desk, and got the monitors set up from that sweet spot. I then took measurements like all over the room with this measurement mic. And it basically just um, sweeps like a sine wave from like zero to like 50, 000, 50 kilohertz or whatever it is, 50,000 kilohertz. And um, it, uh, it, the, the mic picks up not only the frequency response and the curve of the room, but also like the waterfall graph. So like the, decay times and like the actual like reverberations of the room so gik is able to take all of those scans and oh and i made a 3d model of the room of the whole space Mm -hmm. in down to like centimeters so between all the scans and the 3d model gik basically comes in and they're like okay to make this frequency response flat and make it so it's it's dead enough and there's not a ton of decay in the room you just have to put up stuff like here and here and here and here and here's all of the stuff that you would need. And then I bought like half of it from them. I made half of it. I put everything everywhere they said. And then I did the um, sweeps again. And there's like little dips here and there. Like it's it's not going to be perfect. And there's only one room in the world that I can think of that's like near perfect. It's called Archon Studios. And they have spent millions into like treating that room and getting the okay. the, the monitors like hung right and and just. I'll look it in, up. I'm in, very curious in, now. In, yeah. It's not even a commercial studio. It's a it's it's a billionaire who's just really <laughs> into audio, and like made his studio f- for him nice. as a hobbyist. Nice. And it's it's so well tuned that the uh, VSX headphones that I have like the emulate other studios that's like the main room that I use in there is like that guy's studio. And that's it's so not, absurd. Yeah, not even a commercial space. Yeah. But it's, it's just unbelievable. It sounds unbelievable. Even in the headphones, I, I can't imagine what it sounds like when you sit in the real that's room. That's like crazy. I, yeah, uh, man, money is, money is an incredible thing at yeah. that level. Money yeah. is an incredible so thing. yeah, I spent all that money, <laughs> built all that stuff, put up all of the treatment the, yeah. and it sounds immensely better like Mm -hmm. when there's people in the room with me and we've got the monitors going like it it doesn't there's there's not guesswork going on like i i'm very familiar with what my references sound like in that space at this point and and it sounds more than good enough to mix a song in but i still 
after everyone leaves, do all of my final mix tweaks and masters in the headphones in that other Interesting. room. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wrote something down as you were chatting there about how you said that you learned the learned the rebuilding process through the first one, and now you feel comfortable taking it on yourself. And I think uh, last time you were here, we talked about how you were self-taught in audio. Uh, and I, I love for people in this industry or people that I've met along these things, like once you've self-taught audio, you've now ironed out the format of how to learn something and what that process Absolutely. looks like and yeah. what it's like to be bad at that thing and get better. And once you get better, how it diversifies and what you're looking at. Uh, and I think there's a really exciting thing there of like, as you're learning guitar, like you're not just learning guitar, like you're learning how to get good at skills. And then if you decide you want to go build something later, like that guitar playing will help, even though the format. skill, yeah. uh, I think it's a really yeah, exciting thing for me to think about of like, yeah, what else can we get good at? How many things can yeah. people be good at? I was literally just having that conversation with another parent at my son's preschool, mm -hmm. like two days ago, we were talking about how prevalent it is now for people like me and her husband like everything we fix everything we cook like everything we do is like oh, i'll just youtube it like mm -hmm. i want this restaurant but they're not open or i can't go there or whatever like let me just youtube how they make it like yep. it's crazy and that's going to be a huge like kids that learn that young yep. like oh i want to do this let me just youtube even if it goes to like video games like mm -hmm. even it, like her son was playing like minecraft and he was like watching tutorials on how to build something I'm like yeah. that's amazing because when he wants to make a grilled cheese he's gonna go on youtube and he's gonna be like how do i do this and it, yeah. he's gonna be able to like, yeah, I, I love the video game skill. question i think it's so much fun to ask of like yeah there's a chance we're ruining a whole generation of humans but there's also or, a chance yeah. that they are solving problems way more frequently than we did as kids and that is going to yeah pay off huge dividends later on as they're yeah. solving that. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really interesting thing. And I appreciated that you said it because it was like, yeah, that's a, that's what I want to do more. Like it excites of all the reasons to keep learning video and photo and this art. It's like, that is another one of them is yeah. to keep getting good at a thing so that other things become easier to get good at in yeah. a sense. Um, moving on here, my other, or not actually moving on at all, but I wanted to also touch on the kind of like goal setting and how you, so we talked about how you organize your day and kind of what a day looks like. And I'm wondering how much is that like, are you waking up in the morning and going, all right, I'm in the studio at 10 and then figuring it out. How much are you on Sunday night saying, this is what my week's going to look like. How much, you said you're booked for six months. So I mean, it, you are obviously into the future, but how, yeah, how structured is that? How do you approach maintaining order and all of these commitments and responsibilities? So typically my month is filled like, by the first week of the month previously. So at least that's how it's been the last like four months or so. Okay. Um, so basically on like, yeah, like on like a Sunday, I'm typically working, but on like a, maybe Monday or Tuesday when me and Lisa are eating dinner, it'll, it'll kind of be like, a, all right, what am I doing again this weekend? Mm -hmm. Like I've now booked this five, six weeks ago, like, yeah. what, who do I have coming this weekend? And, like, let me make sure I have, like, before they get here, like, all my files set and, like, sessions set up for them and, like, whatever. And then, you know, most days I'm down there at nine working, catching up from the day before, working on my stuff, like, mm -hmm. getting ready for the session that we're about to have. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of booking and keeping in touch with people about what their goals are going to be when they get here. And then revisiting those conversations closer to the day and mm -hmm. being like, okay, this is what I need tomorrow to be ready for this. Mm -hmm. uh, that communication piece is so important of like, yeah, just as long as that line of communication is open, everything can work. But yeah, yeah once that falls apart, um, are you, what was my, I got to start like communicating my brain better and like <laughs> start retaining ideas better. I always like, I have an idea and you keep talking and I get to the next idea. And I'm like, ah, oh, I like the first idea better. I want to remember what that idea was. Um, I'm a big like to-do list person. I like I need like a physical checklist to oh, follow. Absolutely, is that a absolutely. similar thing for you? Especially, it's it's very easy for me to manage. Okay, this week I have four sessions, all ten to eight. I know who's coming in. I know what we're doing. Mm. Gonna be smooth sailing. Where I start to need to-do lists and I start to like need to like keep myself in check sure. is, okay, now those four artists left, and three days later all of them now want to follow up, have notes, like this, this, that. 
and this week I still have four sessions coming up. So yeah, it's every time I'm communicating with them, uh, whether it be notes on the mix or deliverables they need for live or music video or whatever the mm-hmm. case may be, that's when I need to like keep hard lists of like order of importance, all of the things that need to be done, like because I will start to forget like, oh my God, this one person asked me for like stems for a beat for like somebody he's trying to sell a song to or something like it's like little things like that slip up all the time. And I, mm-hmm. I definitely have to keep lists. <laughs> yep. uh, um, I say this with love, but I think the other common thing I've heard is that every client thinks they're your only client, which is a really tough thing of like, I want to give you the best experience, but I'm also giving other people the best experience and I can give it to you today, but tomorrow I have to give it to that person. So yeah. when they come back on Tuesday with mixed notes, it's like, how do you balance those mixed notes with, no, I'm in studio today. Like I am, I have to be a hundred percent with this person and I'll get back to you. But that's always a, a hard balance to keep of, yeah, how many places can your brain be at once? And when is it like, no, 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 I'm only here right now. Yeah. So when I'm in studio with an artist from like that 10 to eight, unless like, I'm basically only even looking at my phone. Like if I run upstairs and grab a bite to eat or like Mm -hmm. take a bathroom break or something. If I'm sitting in front of the computer or sitting there talking to the artist, like my phone doesn't even exist to me. Yeah. Um, so I'm famous for the like, Hey, sorry for the late reply. Like I know you messaged me yesterday morning, but I had a session all day and then had things to follow up on. And now I'm getting back to you and it's the following morning, like Mm -hmm. frequently. Um, but I, I try my best to, to not let it go past like, you know, the next morning yeah. because I do want people to kind of feel like they're my only client mm-hmm. or like maybe not that they're my only person that I'm working with, but they're all equally as important. I like, do care. Yeah. I am involved. Yeah. I'm just involved in other things. And it's yeah. tough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're all equally as important and I'm trying so hard to mm-hmm. give a hundred percent of me yes. to each thing. Yeah. And that's why there's there's projects all the time that I'll just be like, I don't think I'm the right fit for this Mm -hmm. because if it's something that I know I'm not going to love, or if it's a person that I know I'm not going to love working with, all of those little things are going to start to slip through the cracks and it's going to probably just make me look bad in the end. Yep. Like not only to them, but I'm not going to be stoked on what comes out of it. And the the product itself is not going to be what I want my name on. And you're saying all the wisdom I need to hear. Yeah. (laughs) Saying no as in, as in saying no as an act of love is a, is a weird concept and it's one that's taken me a while to wrap my head around of like there are times when saying no to someone is a favor to both of you and i i guess i'm uh giving myself wisdom at the point of like no i still think i feel like when i say no it's a i am doing them a disservice yeah and sometimes maybe that's the case but most of the time if i if your gut says no it's like no no no, this is the right thing for all of us we're both gonna be better off here and it's typically not like uh man, this artist sucks. Like, I don't want to work. It's typically, like, I truly feel for some reason, like, either I know somebody that's better, that's going to do this better than me, and it's going to be better for both of you. Or, like, I am not going to be able to deliver the exact thing you want, and I know that. Or I'm not going to be able to give the attention that you need on this in the amount of time that you need me to like those are the the Mm -hmm. situations where I'm turning people away it's never like a this guy sucks type thing because the one thing that I have learned especially with what Jay does too is there is absolutely a target market for everything there's a target audience for every type of music even if you think it's awful (laughs) I must have said this a thousand times and but my, the best advice I ever got in this industry, in this world, uh, was don't underestimate the size of an audience that you're not a part of. Exactly, yeah. And mm-hmm. it's one of those that, like, I can't remember where I heard it, and it just rings around in my head all the time of, like, every time a band sends me a song, and I'm like, I don't know if this is the one. It's like, no, 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 this is the one for someone. For that, yeah. And my job is to give it that respect of, like, yeah, I might not love the song in six months, but for this month right now, this is my favorite song. Yeah. And it's, it's weird how that, like, becomes active of like once I start on a video like it it becomes my favorite song and it's a very weird like I am intentionally making it that but it also is like no for me to show this song in the best light like I have to approach it as the number one fan of the song I can't approach it as like disdain and create something good Um, and I'm sure it's probably similar for you like I feel like even if maybe I'm not stoked on an original idea or I feel like it's going to change a lot or has to change Mm -hmm. a lot to get to where it needs to be 
every incremental change that I make to it or we make to it together, I'm like excited about. Mm -hmm. So then in turn, all of those tiny little increments of excitement add up to me being like, I love this song. I'm yeah. so stoked on yeah. all of these cool little things yeah. we did. And yeah, it just ends and up being... I think there's also a, like the, the flip side is like, I need someone to pull me out of my comfort zone. Like otherwise I would make the same video every time. Like I need someone to come and be like, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah. And I think similarly, it's like, yeah, we need someone in the, in the studio to butt heads with once in a while because it, not butt heads to, to creatively disagree with. Push me, yeah. 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 That's, uh, that's cool. Like when, when people want to go for things that I don't immediately know how to do mm -hmm. or something yeah. like it doesn't happen super often anymore, but it's like, when it does, it's like, ooh, challenge. Like, yeah. I'm gonna figure out how to make that sound. That's, <laughs> that's my favorite part of video is like, yeah, I, I often bite off more than I can chew and <laughs> I'm in the middle of a big green screen project right now and it's one of those like, oh, are you? oh fuck, <laughs> like, I, I got this, it's all gonna work out, but there's always a moment of like, God damn it. But it is that, like, I'm going to figure out how to make the sound. Like, that sound is the one that is in my brain. That is the one that's going to come out or yep. something close to that. And that's what's happening here. I don't quite know exactly how to get there right now. But yeah. I'm, I'm going to go on YouTube and I'm going to figure out these tutorials and make it happen. Yep. Um, if somebody can make that sound, I can. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think, in any, I, like, it, for me in Premiere, it's like, there's not every effect in the world in Premiere. But there are enough effects that I believe I can make anything. And I assume it in most DAWs is the same thing of like, yeah, you're not going to have every sample pack of every instrument ever. But like at a certain point, you have enough pianos that you can figure it out with some distortion or yeah. whatever. And um, I've, I've learned how to make my own like virtual instruments and stuff. Like there's a new half-hearted song that I had to make a music box sample for. And okay. just like individually sample each note of a music box, so I can then play it on a music. Is a music board. box the like the thing you wind up? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. Yep. Okay, the thing pops out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Or no, not the not the like um, not the jack in the box. Like a music box, like you wind it up, and there's like a little ballerina spinning. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's like ding ding ding. Yeah. Yeah. You know? it, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. The weird things you do. It's a good one. Might be. Um, we'll see you one day. <laughs> uh, on the longer term sense, so is there a, a long term goal with audio production? Like I've, I sometimes struggled because I don't feel like I have a north star. I feel like I, I love doing it and I'm excited to do it each day, but I don't quite know exactly what what road I'm going down. I just am enjoying the road and I'll take some turns when I get there. Yeah. Do you have the same sense with audio? Is there a a singular goal that keeps you going or is it just about loving the process and kind of taking taking turns when they come two different answers one Perfect. i'm just a student to audio i'm absolutely obsessed like yeah. like i almost to the point where i have to consciously be like please just enjoy this song and don't start thinking about the mix. Like, especially if I'm listening to like a new song i've never heard mm -hmm. from like a band i know i like yep. i need to just be like Turn off your technical brain. Just like sit here and like I have no ability for just, that. Yeah, Props to you. it's hard. It's yeah. hard. Like, I mean, like Sleep Token dropped two new songs, and one of them is like one of the best songs I've ever even heard. But the very first thing I thought was like, oh my god, the snare is not tuned high anymore. Like, mm -hmm. I had to just be like, shut up. Just yeah. listen, just listen to this song. It's a fucking snare drum. Like, it sounds like a snare. Get yeah. over it. Yeah. No one else is gonna even notice that. But um, but yeah. So I definitely have to. To separate that. And now that I've explained that, I forgot the second part of the answer. Um, Long-term goals, so oh, enjoy the process. I remember, yes. So I feel like when I started, especially like really early into going full-time, <clears throat> when I started to notice my mixes like getting better and me being happier with them, I was like really hungry to start working with the bands that I like listen to. I mm -hmm. was like, one day I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna work with the bands that I listen to. I'm gonna be working with like the bands that are doing well in this genre. Like it's it's gonna be a thing. And now I've kind of like I still think that would be awesome, but I've almost kind of mindset shifted to one of the local bands that I find and I start working with is gonna be that band. I'm okay. I'm yep. going to find the band that's sick and all they need is me and I'm going to be the thing that makes them mm -hmm. that band Yeah, and then I'll be working with that band. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I think it also goes to the people said don't meet your heroes and I don't think that's quite true. I think oftentimes I've met my heroes and they realize they're human and that almost makes it more incredible that they are superhuman on stage every night. Yeah. 
the flip side is like it does shatter some of the illusion and it's hard to have your favorite band be your favorite band when you've spent time with them in some capacity yep. uh, whether that's in a record studio in a yeah green room wherever and so I think that idea of letting just like let them be your favorite bands like don't try and enter that world let that be your own thing it's like build your own world build yeah. your own circle of favorite bands and I, I love that mentality I've definitely found myself kind of adjusting to the same thing of like yeah I don't know I don't know who's gonna make it but I'm excited to be involved in the process and give yeah. everyone their fair shot and be determined that everyone's gonna make it and I'll be wrong 99% of the time because that's how the industry works yeah. but 100% of the time I'm gonna believe this is the one and go into it with that with that uh with that process. I don't know, that mindset. Yeah. It, it takes one song for an artist yeah. to blow up. Like, <clears throat> and especially all these young artists that are just kind of throwing things at the wall to see what sticks. Like, when that one thing does, now you're going to be able to take all of the other ideas that you've had, mm -hmm. all of the other genres that you're pulling from and stuff, and hone in on that one thing that blew up, but take all of the other cool influence that you've had and shove it into that thing. And that's going to be you and that's going to be the thing that you're, like, remembered for. Like, that's the coolest thing ever. Like, I think you just described Bad Omens in a moment, where it's like they've had this, like, metal thing and then kind of like a, I don't know, more transient, like, a, not pop, but kind of like, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. Like that but like a, dark pop kind yeah, of Yeah, something thing, in there. Yeah. And it's like trappy slowly and Slowly cultivating and, it, yeah. and then now it blows up, and it's like, yeah, that, that isn't an accident. That's no, yeah. three or four albums worth, and probably before, years before that that I don't know about of refining that and processing that and trying to figure out where is the, where's the gem here. Yeah. And finally you find it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they like, definitely, they went from a, a way more guitar driven band to a way more production driven band. Mm -hmm. And I think that. Suits but there is them still the well. metal in there, which definitely. I think is interesting as you were saying, like if you, yeah, you kind of pared down what works and it's, it's been interesting to watch them kind of explore both sides of the pendulum, so yeah. to speak. Um, it also helps that they're just incredible live. <laughs> I think Being I saw them, as always, yeah. <laughs> I think I saw them when was the under oath at the Oakdale? Maybe in the last couple of months. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe six, five months ago, like maybe yeah, somewhere around there probably. And they were playing to like maybe a thousand people, opening for under oath, playing like second at the dome. And I just saw them last month played a sold out palladium headlining like unbelievable that yeah. was not a long time <laughs> yeah yeah one tiktok song that's just yeah and but what happened is all the other songs blew up too exactly P yeah. P people find that one song and they're like wait this is a part of an album that sounds yep. like this i heard that in the context of a, a comedian was explaining like just put out a joke every day and it's not that every joke is going to do well it's that eventually one joke will do well and now you have a whole catalog that people can go explore yep. and it yeah, I loved that idea, and honestly, to some degree, that helps with the podcast and helps me find value in this every day where it's like, yeah, a lot of people aren't going to hear this. Like, it, if I get 100 views, great. That would be, I think, a new record or somewhere around there. But it's like, yeah, hopefully, it'll be fun one day, and if nothing else, it's a, a time capsule for us, or I think it'll be fun at some point in 20 yeah. years to look back and be like, oh, we were kind of idiots back then. Look at what we thought. Look where we were. That was, that was dumb. That was yeah. cool. Good times. The cool thing, too, about making content is like, Every song we make is, like, advertising for everything that we're doing. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, every song that Half Hearted makes is showing my latest mix, Jay's mm -hmm. marketing skills, mm -hmm. your video skills. Like, it's, yeah. it's the, what's creating the content is coming from a place of, like, we really want to make this. Yeah. But in the end, it's, it's never going to be a waste, even if it doesn't do well, because it, it, it is kind of our main form of, like, yeah. getting our brand and our, our businesses out there and stuff. I think I also learned that doing well is a, it's a wildly subjective term. Like, I, in the context of Bad Omens, like, you would expect they'll put out a new song at some point, and I don't know what the number of doing well would be for them. Let's say it's 10 million streams or something. Like, two years ago, that is not doing well for them. Two years ago, that is better than anything could have possibly yeah. been. Two years ago, maybe 100,000. I don't know what the fuck the numbers are. Yeah. but like You shatter those uh, glass ceilings and there's yeah, just another one. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so I think that's uh, really important to keep in mind of like, yeah, not every, yeah, doing well means different things to everyone and yeah. I can't do well <laughs> by a data member standards. Like, I'm just not going to hit those numbers, but like, yeah, how can I do well? And for me, it's showing up every day and giving it your best and it's like, yeah, that is, that's it. That's yeah. all, all we can do. Um, 
My man, thank you for coming through. As we look to wrap up here, what is coming up next? What do you got working on? What should people go follow? Where do people find you? Who is Sean Dalkey? And where do people tell you they love you? Uh, I mix records. That's who I am. Hell and yeah. uh, you can find me on Instagram. It's just Sean Dalkey. Um, my studio is Studio 86 CT. Um, and I sing for Half Hearted, obviously. Uh, our socials are all, I think, at Half Hearted underscore CT. Um, definitely go follow Justice Michael, follow Cortland Young, follow Stand Corrected, brand new band. I don't even know if Stand Corrected has socials yet, but they, I know they're coming to you for like five new videos. They have a really, really cool record, and we're already working on the second one. They're doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, there's a band called Allurement from Connecticut that's coming out with a lot of new, really cool, heavy stuff. Definitely go check them out. Just leaking and all the new Connecticut releases. Yeah, right? Hell yeah, dude. All these new bands you don't even know. <laughs> And uh, oh, yeah, dude. and last but definitely not least, my boys in Chain Twist. They of course. are they are killing it right now. We're working on some really really cool stuff that I'm really excited dude, about I'm, right now. So. I'm excited. I like yeah. I love being a fan of them right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's real fun. Yeah, great dudes, great it's music. And when they start playing shows, oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> dude, Point Beach is opening. Apparently, apparently, oh. seen the rumors they're online. Gonna, they're gonna close it. I, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that would be wow. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that is a perfect Point Beach band yeah. coming around at this dude, time. Dude, if they play Point Beach, we're going. Holy we're we're hell, coming dude. too. I'm fully padded going to that. Yeah. <laughs> Just full suit of armor to get yeah. in there. Dude, My man. last time we were talking about how like Point Beach was closed and like a thing in our past. Yeah. And now it's like back in the future. Again. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Joe Miller. <laughs> hell yeah, dude. Well, thank you for coming in, my guy. Dude, I appreciate it. Thanks for having uh, me. If as anyone always. listened, my new challenge is that anyone who listens to this and enjoys it, I want them to go tell you that they enjoyed it. Tell me, all because, right. Yeah, I want them to go message you. So that's my, I don't know, that's my new goal. Yeah, so I'm, I'm always down to talk home. to people too. I, um, love, I love meeting new people and talking about stuff like this. Fire. It's yeah. my whole life, really. <laughs> yeah. Message Sean, tell him to come back here someday, and I'm sure we'll do this again soon one day. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> my God, thank you.